Well, we, we always think about it'd be ideal if you could char get charged as you're going down the highway. Yeah, that's exactly. uh, something people have always wanted to do. Uh, we certainly have that in mind. I can't give you a time schedule on, uh, you know, higher power devices, but know that we've already shown products that are um, 50 times the power of our smaller device uh, operating mm. uh, effectively over distance. We're going through something absolutely historic. Technologies across the board are growing exponentially. It's a disruption that's going to completely redefine the way businesses compete. In the next decade, we're going to lose 40% of today's Fortune 500 companies. The exponential growth of computing is continuing. AI is nowhere near its full potential. Whether you like it or not, that the future cannot be stopped by anyone. So welcome back to the Future Tech and Foresight podcast. As always, I'm your host, Mark Verbenkoff. So today's episode will focus on a technology that I actually haven't brought up on the podcast before. I've been really looking forward to learning more about it and have been thinking quite a lot about it since the interview I had with today's guest. So hopefully you'll be doing the same as its uh, ability to kind of enable pretty massive changes in our society in the years to come might actually not be so obvious when you initially uh, hear about it. So today we'll be looking at wireless charging technology, how it works, what its applications are, uh, the challenges and potential safety issues that it has, and of course, its impact on the future. So very briefly, here's what ChatGPT thinks about wireless charging technology. So it's a rapidly growing frontier driven by the relentless pursuit of convenience and technological advancement. It's transforming not just personal device usage, but also broader sectors like electric vehicles and industrial applications. As the technology matures, it's expected to fuel a surge of innovation efficiency and adaptability across various industries. Its potential impact is immense, reducing our dependence on cables, promoting sustainable energy use, and facilitating seamless device integration into our daily lives. In essence, wireless charging is not just about power transfer, it's about empowering a new era of technological freedom and advancement. So I kind of like that, and I might actually be using ChatGPT to kind of give a rough overview of the market and the technology in future episodes, so let me know. But what ChatGPT kind of laid out is more or less exactly what we'll be getting into on today's episode with my guest, Kurt Weber from WeCharge. So Kurt has a BSEE from Clarkson University in New York and did 17 years of design and systems engineering for commercial business products, military ordnance, and telephony products while working for Texas Instruments, general computer, and building systems automation. Moving into sales, Kurt was in sales management in the semiconductors market while working for companies such as NCR Microelectronics, LSI Logic, Tundra Semiconductors, and QLogic to achieve $300 million plus in combined sales from enterprise server storage customers, including HP, Dell, IBM, and Storage Tech. We had a really interesting conversation today. Uh, I was very grateful for him to come on and talk about wireless charging and kind of expand my knowledge on the technology, uh, the challenges, the applications, and of course the future. I hope that you really enjoyed the episode and I think you'll find it very interesting, especially if you haven't heard of or really looked into wireless charging technology in the past. But if you have, there's of course some really interesting insights that Kurt's able to bring into the podcast. Great. Well, hi there, Kurt. Thank you very much for coming on to the podcast today to talk about uh, your company uh, and wireless uh, technology, which, as I mentioned right before recording, I know very little about. So I'm also very interested and excited to, to learn a little bit more about it today. Okay, Mark, it's uh, good to talk with you. And I'm really interested in uh, just discussing this product and the, the solutions that are out in the marketplace uh, for wireless power today. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so uh, also, as I mentioned right before, what I like to do with most guests is to kind of get where this technology was interesting for you and why you got um, started with this kind of technology. So if you can bring us back a couple of years, uh, what made you or Wimby, what was the first time that you heard about wireless um, uh, charging technology and how did you start getting interested in this? Yeah, it was about it was about four years ago. I was doing some consulting work for a couple of uh, technology firms. 
And uh, one of the people I worked with years ago uh, had give, given me a call, said, hey, you got to look at this technology. It's pretty interesting. There's a wireless power. And I go, well, wireless power, that's just that thing you put your phone on, right, to uh, charge up your phone. He goes, no, no, you, you need to come look at this. This is actually sending power across the air, big distances. So I went ahead and took a look at it. I actually met with him and uh, saw the demo. It was outside the lab. It looked like a production product. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite interesting. Um, I, was, I was intrigued by it because uh, of the distance and the power that was being sent across the air. And the fact that uh, if you think about it, you think about when Wi-Fi first came out. Mm -hmm. That was probably about 20, 25 years ago. And it was brand new. And there was a standard for it. And some products started coming out. Now it's everywhere. I mean, it's a huge market. Everybody's got Wi-Fi on their handhelds. And they got Wi-Fi in their house and their businesses. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. And I said, you know, if, the, if you could do the same thing with power, uh, you all of a sudden have everything's like no cables. And you can move it around. And you'd be talking to it communication-wise through Wi-Fi and power through wireless power. As so you've mm -hmm. got something that's totally floating around in a room. It could be anywhere. It could be sitting on a desk, on a wall, on a, on a glass door. It doesn't matter. I said, this is, this is really kind of, kind of a neat technology. So I started looking at it in more detail and I, I realized that uh, it, it's already been looked at from a, a market cap standpoint. And it's, and it's huge. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it's going to be, uh, it's estimated to be about $35 billion by 2030. Crazy. And uh, that's, that's something I was pretty interested in. That's yeah. how I got involved. And <laughs> yeah. so this, this is a company I'd like to work for. So I came aboard. Yeah, definitely a uh, good market to to be entering. <laughs> uh, something new, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It, um, when I when I first um, uh, looked at your website, uh, immediately I started thinking about uh, Nikola Tesla, right? I think that there were some, uh, whether they were hidden manuscripts or, or something like that, that uh, he had already come up with something like this, you know, many, many decades ago. Um, and it's interesting now to see that, you know, you actually have a working product. Uh, this is actually something that's out there. So kind of like from the past to the future to the current uh, times, uh, it's it's already available, which is... Yeah, yeah he struggled for years to try to get uh, massive amounts of power sent, uh, you know, over, over the airways. He was successful in getting power over small distances. Mm. And the... Uh, phone charging pad that well, I was just I was just talking about that essentially is what what he came up with uh, of okay. course there was no iPhones at the time but mm -hmm. the ability to transfer power over a few millimeters he, he was able to do that um, 100, 100 years ago mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so so he, some of his stuff lives on for sure cool uh, well then why don't we uh, why don't we jump into the technology itself right so uh, I, I mentioned that most of my audience are not highly technical in nature. But I still think, even for me, it would be interesting to know roughly how this technology works because I don't think too many people understand it too well. Yes, I think I think it would be good to go over that for sure. Mm. Uh, I mean, you can kind of think of it like Wi-Fi. There's a there's a there's a, there's a transmitter that's transmitting something, and the receiver is picking up something. In this case, it's it's power. Mm. Uh, so it's 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 a um, it consists of, of two basic product, a transmitter and receiver. Uh, we, we use uh, infrared technology in order to, uh, to, to transfer the power from the transmitter to the receiver, which is a very safe, effective means of getting uh, energy uh, across the airways. Uh, the, the Nikola Tesla solution that I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, that's used in the cell phone charging pads and things like toothbrush chargers, that's that's got a very limited distance, mm. but this is what we call long distance, high power transmission of, of energy, um, and the the transmitters are typically mounted either on a shelf or on a ceiling, sort of like a recessed light, and is able to find receivers which would typically be incorporated into a product, and the, the product could be a phone, but you would typically think of something. Uh, more in line with uh, a useful product for the home, maybe like a, uh, a portable speaker, for example, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, currently uses batteries, or maybe a security device on the wall, um, like a like a pad or something like that. Or even more close to home would be like a smart lock. A smart lock has batteries in it, and you have to change those batteries out every couple of months or you're going to be locked out of your home. Mm -hmm. And you can use this technology 
this wireless technology in order to run those products uh, using the wireless power. Yeah, super interesting. Um, so you also mentioned that uh, Nikola Tesla could only do it for a couple of millimeters and he had challenges, vast technological challenges in order to make it uh, longer than that. Uh, it seems like uh, you guys and and maybe the, the guy that introduced you to the technology about four or five years ago figured out a way to to you know solve that challenge. Uh, how exactly was that done? How has uh, your company made this happen? Well, there's uh, the, the people that run the engineering team are, are, are quite smart. They came from the military. They understand how uh, infrared technology works uh, in the military applications, and they utilize what they learned uh, in in a commercial environment uh, to utilize that. And that's something that like, Tesla didn't have at the time. Uh, but there's another medium for sending power, and that's that's using light as opposed to RF energy or Nikola Tesla's uh, point of view, more of, more like lightning from what I've seen in those <laughs> pictures. Uh, and it, you know, using using microprocessors and and uh, uh, building the, the proper algorithms, uh, we're able to uh, form a beam of energy that uh, we can transmit to the receivers that are incorporated into different customers' products whether it's a lock or whether it's a charging pad, whether it's a speaker, whether it's uh, maybe an actual charging pad for your phone that doesn't have a wire going to the wall. Uh, that's something that's, that's very possible. In fact, we have demos for that right now. Yeah. Um, it's, that's the, that's, that's how we were able to overcome that was that the technology of other types of solutions have, have come to fruition. So we can, we can leverage that microprocessors, different types of diodes for sending out infrared uh, ways of pointing at the beams, ways of understanding uh, where the beam's going to go and make sure it hits the target exactly where it's supposed to without any uh, intervention by the user. Very interesting. Yeah. This is uh this is a big, trend that keeps coming up on the podcast actually is right you you have one technology here one technology there another technology there and you can kind of combine them all to bring about whether it's a new product or an entirely new industry that's available to to be birthed if you will uh through yeah, exactly this, through this uh, mixing and blending of other kind of various technologies that i think in the past would would not have mixed at all right but you bring about some unique mixture and it enables enables something really cool. That's exactly right. And this technology will enable other technologies yeah. to come to fruition, which would not be possible without it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely, I definitely want to get into that uh, later on in the podcast, but so uh, of course, everybody's aware right now that there's a, there's this giant boom, this, this discussion of uh, AI, specifically generative AI. So you mentioned uh, an algorithm as part of that mix combo of the different kind of technologies. Can you maybe touch on that a little bit? Uh, I know we didn't uh, touch on that before, but uh, uh, for me, I'm, I'm quite interested in AI. So it'd be in curious to hear about how um, artificial intelligence or a certain kind of algorithms have helped this technology come about. Well, it's, I wouldn't really call it artificial intelligence, but we'll call it an algorithm for sure. So it's just standard programming. But the, the way the way that we do it is we're able to actually view a room with our transmitter to understand where the devices are in the room. Mm. And there can be more than one. I mean, it could be one, it could be two, it could be five. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the, the actual limitation is not really technical. It's really physical. There's only so many, you know, door locks and you know, security badge you can put into a room. Yeah. Um, but we were able to actually go out and look with this is before sending any any energy. This we can go out mm -hmm. and actually re view the room and build a map internal to the to the transmitter of where these different devices are. And then we can point that beam at each one of the receivers one at a time and just go through the whole list uh, for a certain amount of time for each one of those receivers. Therefore we're able to supply power to the product. And then we can move that beam to another product and char and and power that one as well. And you may say, well, you got a problem because you're only one device is working at a time, but that's not really true. What we do is we actually store the energy inside of the device using a, a lithium ion cell. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a non replaceable um, cell that's usually soldered under the circuit board and it can store quite a bit of energy. So every time we, we bring the beam over, and point it to a receiver on a device, it's charging um, that 
internal battery and keeps it charged all the time. So we're almost mm. like a trickle charger, just like you'd have on your car, mm. Mm. Uh, where we use a, a low amount of energy. Well, it's, it's high by wireless power standards, but maybe low compared to a car battery, for example. Right. But we're able to put that energy into the into the battery uh, of the device, and the device literally uses that energy in order to perform its task, whatever it may be, like if it's a speaker, it's playing music, while you're moving that beam to another device, for example, to charge the battery that may be in, oh, let's say it's a window shade, a motorized yeah. window shade. So we store that energy into that one and we just move it around. And it's all done automatically. And if you move something, let's say it's yeah, something on your desk and you move it a yeah. few inches. In fact, I, I was showing you in the video a minute ago that if I move if I move something just a little bit, it will find it. It go go back. The, uh, the algorithm is set up where periodically it looks around the room to see if anything has been moved, added, or removed, and it rebuilds the map. So it's it's that's how that works. So there's mm-hmm. really no you know user intervention that's required. It's all you just turned it on and it yeah. works and that's the beauty of it that's why i really like this product quite a bit cool um okay well well you answered my question about uh where or what would happen if you're going to be moving some of these uh, receivers um so you also touched on you know some of the uh, use cases or applications that this that this technology is useful for it, it sounds like it's um quite useful obviously for any kind of home or office environment um whether you have uh, cell phones or laptops uh you know being used uh, around the the area or or smart locks or whatever are there any um uh kind of industrial um applications that have been used so far or is that something uh planned for the future or it's this is uh this is you almost can consider our product like a component so we, 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 we do address and talk to the different customers in the different market segments. Now, we're a relatively small shop at the moment. So mm-hmm. we've kind of like focused on a couple of, of uh, uh, areas where we're putting most of our effort. But from a technology standpoint, uh, if you talk about the industrial sector, for example, there's nothing but sensors in when these big factories, yeah. they're everywhere yeah. and they're, they're either wired up or they're battery operated. Even if they're wired, they may be in motion in which case there's, mm-hmm. you got other issues with getting power to the devices. This is a perfect solution for industrial sensors. Uh, they're usually low power. There may be thermal sensor, vibration sensors, optical sensors, all types of things. But we can, with a, with a small lithium ion storage cell built into it along with our receiver, uh, we can be powering multitude of these sensors in the, in the factory floor. So that it's a it's a perfect solution for for those types of things, in a commercial environment, uh, in in the security area, locks, keypads, uh, thermostats, uh, dampers on air conditioning, HVAC systems, uh, you name it, uh, we we have a very good solution. And again, the window shades, the blinds that are used, they're mm. typically run by motors, and those motors are either controlled by the building management software or, or you know, Margaret down the hall, who happens to be the secretary, will raise or lower them. But nonetheless, when you when you build a building, you have the ability to put AC power to the windows without any without much problem. Uh, but if you're doing a retrofit on the building, it's very difficult to run a wire to a window. Mm-hmm. So which means that you have to use batteries, usually large batteries, that have to be pulled out and recharged periodically. We can eliminate that quite easily mm-hmm. with a, a wireless power type solution and power multiple shades with just one transmitter. So there's a good application there. In the medical field, mm-hmm. we're finding some great uses uh, for our product. Um, one complaint we got from some of the hospitals is that the over-the-bed table, which is usually used for food service and it's used for the patient when they're in bed, is a, a great place to put a charging system in for their iPhones. Currently, what they do is they, the patient will have a cable and they run it to their headboard, which may have a USB connector, and they plug it in. And the doctors come in, and it's the last thing they want to do is fight with cables around the right. around the patient. So this is great because you can wheel over the, um, the, the table, the over-the-patient table, and inside of that can be a built-in... Um, wireless what we call wireless uh charging pad for an iphone which is literally wireless we can we charge that and and power that with a uh a charging uh transmitter mounted up in the ceiling 
and it can be anywhere in the room and it'll be charged all the time. So that's a great application for it, along with medical sensors. Uh, uh, they, have, they have critical sensors for medication that are currently battery operated. That's always been a problem for them because they have to change out the batteries before the batteries go bad, which is kind right, of a difficult right. thing, which means it's a maintenance schedule. Plus they got the issue with throwing the batteries away and things of that nature. So that's another application for it. And then conference room tables, same thing with the charging. There's a, there's a multitude of applications. And the way I tell people to look at it is the current products we have right now are ideal for smart home yep. and office type environment uh, products that run on you know, a couple of double A or triple A batteries uh, or are not heavily used. In other words, they're, uh, they, they only cycle a couple of times a day where we can charge up a big lithium ion cell inside so they can run motors. That would be the, an example would be the window shades. Another example in the medical field would be a motorized um, reclining chair uh, for patients, which right now are all manually operated mm. by the nurses. Mm. Uh, they can't use motors because you have to plug it into a wall. That's a trip hazard. They won't allow it in the hospital room. So mm. you can see there's all kinds of applications. Wherever you look, there's an application for, for this type of device. Very interesting. And it, yeah, so it seems like, so not only are there many applications, but there's many different industries that are going to be maybe not necessarily disrupted, but, you know, made more efficient, uh, made right. safer, uh, wherever this kind of technology is going to be applied to. I, yes. I, can, I can only assume that uh, within your company, you're also kind of looking out into other uh, industries that maybe are not like, um, if you're talking about the kind of the low hanging fruit or the easiest ones to see, I'm sure that as the years goes by, there's going to be other industries that maybe you and your team haven't thought of that are going to be, you know, made more smart, uh, made more digital as time goes on, right? So your technology will become more relevant for those kinds of industries as, as time goes on. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we're yeah. keeping a list. Yeah, yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> it's probably growing day by day. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. Yeah, uh, in in a um, in a previous life, not that long ago, I worked uh, in Europe uh, for uh, for a consultancy that worked a lot on like Industry 4.0 and these smart factories, right? So there's a there's a, you you touched on it, but of course there's this massive trend of reshoring factories uh, from overseas, bringing them back to kind of the Western world, and uh, smart factories are one of the key components of this trend, right? Enabling more efficient uh, factories to build a lot of the products back either in Canada or America or, or in Europe. Um, so it sounds like one of the things that will be really highly benefiting these these factories will be the sensors that enable them to you know save on maintenance costs right if you if you have to stop an entire line from from functioning because oh one one uh, tool one machine went down but if you have a sensor on it you can do this kind of preventative maintenance but if that sensor right. goes dead yeah, yeah predictive maintenance if that sensor goes dead uh because it doesn't have you know the right kind of power going to it then it sounds like your technology will be able to how should i say uh facilitate the smart manufacturing uh trend or industry 4.0 trend uh, as time goes on so for, for me anyways that i've worked in that industry for a while that's quite interesting to hear yeah, it sounds great. And also also the fact now that you've got faster uh, communication networks now available as yeah. well, like 5G. And that allows you to have a lot more sensors in a room and you can get a lot more data. The more data you have, the more you're, the better off you are for making decisions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, well, let, let, let's dump, uh, let's uh, save the kind of future impacts for later because that's something I really want to kind of dive into a little bit more. Um, sure. I, I was talking to um, some family members um, just the other day about uh, this upcoming interview, and uh, there was some, you know, some concern about the health impacts, right? So as you mentioned at the beginning, all kind of office environments, all home environments, they're all surrounded with uh, with Wi-Fi, and now we have you know 5G concerns, whether they're valid or not, I, I still don't know. I'm on the fence about that. But there were some, of course, uh, of course, there were some concerns about uh, having wireless charging technology in a home. So, I mean, we talked a little bit about it beforehand about, uh, you know, the safety aspects. You showed me a demo of it, but maybe for the audience, it'd be interesting to hear about kind of the the safety issues, the health concerns that you guys have obviously uh, looked into and and most probably solved. That was one of the key items that uh, I was very impressed with when I first started looking at the company. And once I got 
involved and I realized that when they started the company, safety was one of the key items that they mm. wanted to address. And that was one reason that they didn't go down the wireless, you know, the, the radio frequency solution for wireless power, which is what some of our competitors are doing. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's what uh, uh, Tesla was trying to do as well. The problem is with those types of solutions is that you literally broadcast, you're broadcasting energy into the room and everything's picking it up. Uh, mm -hmm. The tables, the chairs, the ceiling, the walls, and unfortunately you and the dog are getting hit with all this, uh, well, I, I call it RF pollution, radio frequency mm -hmm. pollution. Um, it, it's, you, you want it to go to your end device. Now, when you're talking Wi-Fi, you're talking some pretty low power signals. When you're trying to run a motor, it's a different yeah. story. Yeah. So the, it, the logical thing to do is crank up the transmit power, which of course turns your whole room into a kind of an like I won't get to the large microwave oven is the best way I can describe it. But I was very I would be very concerned about that. Now yeah. they're trying to mitigate that by steering the beams, but it's hard to steer radio frequency beams because they, they don't tend to be beams. They're 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 a broadband. They diverge as soon as they leave the antenna. Mm. They spread out. Every time you double the distance you you know you go down by you know 75% of your power uh, inverse square law. And it's it's not a viable solution for high power. They they are able to transmit uh, low power compared to what we have and what you probably would consider reasonable power for a AA or AAA battery solution. Um, but it's only for a meter or two, and as you get past that, it starts to disappear. Well, that just means you're you're absorbing the energy along with the rest of the things right. in your in your in your environment. Uh, the fact that we're using light, which is the safe band of the light uh it's infrared and it's less than the energy you'd get if you walked outside as far as collecting the energy from the sun but it's all concentrated in the beam and the trick there is to make sure the beam doesn't uh, uh interfere with people and yeah. we and that's part of the algorithm uh that i mentioned yeah. earlier we don't turn the beam on until we have a clear sight of where the beam's going to go okay. we know it's going to go to a receiver and we know exactly where it is because we found it earlier. We know it within a you know half inch or quarter of an inch where it is in the environment. And when we turn on the beam, if anything gets in the way of that, the beam immediately shuts off and stays shut off until the obstruction is removed. And that's part of the whole safety algorithm that mm -hmm. we have in there. We've already got certifications uh, proving it. So it's a very safe, uh, non-destructive way of delivering power from one point to another. Yeah. Yeah, that's great to hear. And uh, for, for those of you listening, uh, Kurt, you showed me right before we actually started recording a, a very short demo where you actually held your hand in front of the receiver and the light went off. Right. So it's not like you're you're making this stuff up. It, it, it absolutely shuts off. Um, yeah, we've got a great demo that we show at the CES shows and mm -hmm. the, some other shows that we go to, which is nothing more than a Lego train. And we just took one of our receivers with two wires, wired it directly to the motor. And then we have a transmitter sitting above it and it, uh, it's a perpetual train. It just keeps running and running. And we use that train to show that there's no problem. You can put your hand in front of that yeah. beam and it shuts down immediately. You remove your hand and about three, four seconds later, the beam's reestablished and the train takes off again. And it's a great way to show that there's not an issue with, you know, you can't feel the beam because it's not there. As yeah. soon as you put your hand there, it's gone. Yeah. So there's, there's no issue. Cool. Well, uh, my my potential fears have been uh, calmed by uh, what you were saying. Um, it, to, to me, it sounds like uh, a completely different technology from the competitors as, as well. So that's true. We differentiate ourselves just just with that alone. Yeah, yeah. And, and I I guess you kind of already touched on it, but I, it would also be the same issue with uh, interference of other um, electronics or or um, technologies in the house, right? So if it's just the one beam, it's not like the radio frequency that's going all over the place. It's not going to be interfering, say, with your cell phone if you're trying to charge your smart lock or anything like that. It's just the one thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's totally uh, oblivious to the RF that's floating around in your room. It's just a, a beam of light. Yeah. And um, have there been issues with uh, disrupting other uh, for, for competitors or for other uh, um, companies using the different kinds of technologies? Like do those um, 
uh, wavelengths like interrupt the actual technologies in in the other things that aren't necessarily charging? Well, I'm not that familiar with the competitor's product or the or the, the frequencies that they're transmitting it at, at. But whenever you do transmit energy like that, mm-hmm. you got to talk to the FCC because mm-hmm. you're you're all of a sudden the transmitter. So they're going to be very careful about you know where you're where you're located on the frequency band and how much energy you're putting out there. So there's issues with that. We don't have to we don't have to do anything with the FCC outside of standard compliance because we have microprocessors in our products. And that means there's a clock in there, and that requires us to get FCC uh, certification, which we already have. But it's very, very low energy stuff. Okay. So, so regulatory issues for your company might be low, um, but for the larger industry that might be using a different kind of technology, the the hurdles might be a little bit more substantial. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, uh, what about technological hurdles for the future? Right. So. You're, you're talking about uh, maybe relatively small uh, things that are going to be charged. Um, you can't necessarily charge, say, a car, for instance, right? If we're moving into this EV revolution, um, is, are you maybe a couple of years away from being able to charge a car or, or some larger um, technologies like that? Or is that so far away that uh, it's not worth talking about? Well, we, we always think about it'd be ideal if you could char- get charged as you're going down the highway. Yeah, That's uh, exactly. something people have always wanted to do uh we certainly have that in mind i can't give you a time schedule on uh you know higher power devices but know that we've already shown products that are uh, 50 times the power of our smaller device uh operating Mm. uh, effectively over distance Um, we don't have it productized because there's really not a market for something that requires that kind of power now higher power there might be some requirements for that Uh, and we would address that when the when when the cost model is appropriate for that particular business plan Mm -hmm. and right now it's pretty expensive to go into those higher power modes and we and we see that the market's exploding with uh, smart controllers and battery operated type devices. So mm. that's where we're going to sit to start with and we'll build off of, off of that foundation. Yeah. 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 Of course. Um, and, uh, I guess also for those, um, just to go back on it, the, the higher power would enable you to charge things at a longer distance as well. Right. Because, uh, distance. Well, not necessarily, but, no. uh, it, it's, it's, uh, the, the distance thing is another, is another set of issues that we have to uh, worry about too. And you're thinking about a beam going a long distance. It's got a small target. Any kind mm-hmm. of vibration at the transmitter side is going to move that beam. Just like if you're holding a, uh, a you know, an infrared pointer, you know, mm-hmm. a, a little LED pointer. And um, that is, um, that's part of the concern is how do you keep the beam stable? Uh, we got algorithms for that as well. We got ways of actually follow, you know, moving the device and the beam following the device. We've actually demoed that as well. For mm-hmm. example, the train that I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've we've got these things in the bag, uh, but uh, the 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 power, the higher the power, doesn't necessarily equate to a longer distance. Um, in fact, as our lower power one goes a few feet longer than our higher power unit. Okay. Uh, but they're two different things. But we're addressing both of them together to to get uh more improvement now one thing we can do today for people that need higher power is we can we can have more than one transmitter yeah. uh, and more than one receiver so you can actually gang them up and we've talked about uh up to four uh, transmitters in the housing uh that would be fairly easy for us to come to market for people that needed uh you know something that was you know over a watt worth of power at uh you know 20 feet we could do that mm-hmm. okay interesting um, maybe the, the kind of final concern that, uh, you know, I was trying to brainstorm, uh, before we, before we met was uh, potential overheating issues, right? So there have been, of course, a lot of these, um, batteries and smartphones that have been recalled. I think, you know, I think it was Samsung a couple of years ago, that, like one of these batteries just yeah. spontaneously combusted. <laughs> um, I, I'm just, you know, of course, people are going to be listening to this and thinking, well, health concerns and maybe overheating and, you know, exploding batteries concerns. So, so how have you guys uh, dealt, dealt with that? Well, we, we, we can actually monitor the temperature uh, of some of some of our hot components in the transmitter anywhere in the world, mm-hmm. uh, because everything's connected up to the cloud. And the, the, the heating part will, would be at the transmitter side. 
Uh, so we wa- we do watch that, but uh, it's it's well within within spec uh, for what I've seen, and um, I haven't seen anything uh, even even in the hot environment where I'm in Texas right now, and uh, it's over 100 degrees already today, and things that are mounted that kind of ceiling they they're exposed to the attic, and uh, we don't have any problems with that either. Um, on the receiver side, there is a lithium. Uh, cell that we recommend for most designs in order to store the energy as the beam is disrupted or moving and charging something else. Now, those are the smaller, they're usually very small type batteries or the the lithium polys, which are Mm -hmm. the kind that you might see that look kind of like flat packs. Um, They're, those, those are controlled uh, by a charging circuit. And uh, that is kind of outside of what we do, but those are very common type designs the samsung thing was a, a bad design they yeah. were just charging it wrong that's why it, why it got into a uh, into a mess and uh, you've got you got a properly charged lithium ion or you could have you could have some problems with the overheating uh but that is actually a that's that is the design that is put to bed it's 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 well documented people know how to do it now and it's actually all it's all available in a single chip form Mm-hmm. So it's uh, nothing to really concern yourself with. Your, your your phones don't burn up anymore. Products don't burn up anymore. Um, they just, they seem to have it figured out. Yeah. Okay. Okay, clear. Um, well, why don't we move on to what is typically my favorite part of the interview, which is uh, the future impacts, right? So we've touched on that a little bit throughout uh, throughout the discussion here, um, whether when we were talking specifically about the applications. Um, so if, if say smart factories might be one of the, I would say the main industries that are going to be enabled with this kind of technology and maybe even more advanced smart factories than what we have today. Um, have there, has there been uh, some discussions in your company about like what kind of other maybe larger ramifications across industries or societies that uh, wireless charging would, would enable, um, you know, maybe industries that would be disrupted Um just kind of your yes, we, we have one that uh, we pinpointed about a year ago and are putting quite a bit of an effort into, and that's the retail advertising market. Hmm. Currently, if you go into a retail store, you, you see advertisement everywhere. As soon as you walk in, you see it on the doors. You might see a TV up on the wall. But when you get to the shelf, there's really nothing there except cardboard. Hmm. That's pretty much state of the art. Occasionally, you'll see a plugged in you know maybe a tablet or something with a display on it Uh, you might see something with a blinking light but the reality is that these stores that have these shelves or gondolas we call it there's no power and you that's the reason why you haven't seen any kind of interesting displays of advertising at the shelf level and it's an important part because that is the point the consumer is choosing their final product. If you're looking at, you know, different cereal brands, do they get cornflakes or do they get Cheerios? You know, they're making that right. decision. And if you have an advertisement there, you can have a significant impact on what they're going to reach for in that, you know, a third of a second that it, it takes mm-hmm. them to make a decision. Mm-hmm. So we have developed as our own product. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we usually sell our product as a component for people to integrate into their devices and they sell that to the marketplace. Mm-hmm. We now have a product. We said, we're going to design this ourselves. So we have the transmitter, as we talked about before, plus a, a device, which is a display with our receiver already integrated into it and the battery. And it's a full motion uh, LCD high definition display uh, that mounts on a shelf anywhere you want in the store. And it will show advertisements that we can download off the internet uh, from uh, a central uh, tool, which we call a content management system, uh, anywhere in the world. So we can sell that service or we can sell the display and somebody else can sell the service. And uh, people like Coca-Cola or Pepsi can advertise on it if they want to as, as, a, as what we call a, a CPG, they're the consumer product group, uh, or the retail company themselves, let's say it's a Best Buy, for example, wants to advertise um, products that's for sale for the weekend and the 4th of July, they can advertise what's on sale at, at that shelf 
for that day. And it can mm-hmm. change up quite a bit. So all of a sudden now it's uh, you can get a lot more impact uh, for pushing a particular product brand or uh, a line of products within a brand uh, at the at the shelf level. This, this is this is quite interesting. We've, we've already developed a five inch display that's powered by these things that we can run multiple ones of those per transmitter. And we also have a uh, just introduced our seven inch uh, display as well, which is actually quite large for the shelf, but is also very useful for mounting on like cooler doors in a convenience store, for example. Super interesting. Have has uh, have you or your team thought at all about the uh, say the metaverse or augmented reality? Uh, you know, Apple's uh, uh, Vision Pro just came out. Uh, what was it last month? The month before. Uh, it's. I still think it's it's several years away, of course. But uh, this is something that specifically for retailers has been talked about a lot about you know revolutionizing the way that information is presented to potential consumers. I can only imagine that your technology would be kind of instrumental to showcasing some of whether there are different kind of advertisements or or descriptions of the products. Um, it's a, it, to, to me, it sounds like that's maybe let's say let's say it's ten years away or something like that. Uh, is that maybe too far for you guys to be thinking, or is that something that? Uh... Well, it's too far for me to be thinking, but I'm sure our <laughs> marketing people are all over it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, because it, like. If you're if you're offering displays to you know potential customers of yours, uh, that is of course the kind of next step up from say a cardboard you know price display. Um, but if say in ten years time people are walking around with you know maybe not Apple's AR uh, glasses, but it's Google's or you know Samsung's or whatever, uh, I would assume that a lot of the the information that is going to be displayed in in front of them um would need to be synced of course to the to the glasses but there would need to be some sort of power source to be able to showcase some of the things that are that are being shown so that yeah, might be yeah. uh, uh that would be an excellent example of uh, utilizing our solution yeah. and like i mentioned before we have tracking software already so we could we could uh follow the person and uh charge charge the uh the the glasses the, the, the headset of course yeah even the yeah. headset itself right really interesting yeah that would be a, that would be a very good application yeah yeah we're already talking about doing things like uh uh having displays on shopping carts for example and those those will be right. movable as well so, right. so we have that as well and by the way we don't have to have these displays just for retail we've actually installed them into uh, fast food restaurants and casual mm-hmm. restaurants and breweries and things of that nature uh, to show and advertise uh, you know, products that they may sell that may not be their main line. Like for example, at the, at a brewery, we just installed this at the, obviously beer is the big thing they have, but they also have wine they're offering now and they've got four or five bottles of wine of uh, different types that they like to advertise. They've got a food kitchen and mm-hmm. they were wanted to push the food because that's higher, higher margin than, than the beer is and goes good with beer. <laughs> so that's a, uh, that's worked out very well for them. Very interesting. Yeah, the the more I think about it, the more kind of uh, industries or sectors are going to be maybe not disrupted. I don't think disrupted is the right term for this. It's like supported or or you know some sort of growth is going to be offered to them through the, the the technology that you guys have. It's very interesting. Yeah, and and, e- and even today uh, we can offer that to some people. Like for example, yeah. uh, s- smart locks, uh, which is one of my favorite things that we do. The the smart lock. Uh, it was the very first thing that we did that we integrated our product with. And then you can actually buy a lock today uh, from a company up in Toronto, uh, Alfred, which makes uh, a mortise lock, which is an industrial lock, and also a deadbolt lock for residential and high-end homes. And we power the, uh, we actually recharge their lithium ion cell with our, with our solution. Mm-hmm. But the beauty of it is that it's always charged. So they don't have to just have you know, just operate a motor and operate a display. They can they can now add all these features that could never right. afford right. earlier because they have to restrict power usage. Otherwise, their batteries wear out too quickly. Mm-hmm. So now they can have things like uh, a retina scan or they can have uh, fingerprint identification, facial recognition, um, you know, your ring camera, uh, your Nest camera, that can all be incorporated into your door locks. So you don't have to have a separate device. You've already got a camera pointed out there. And if 
you have a camera pointed to the front, you can have a screen in the back so you can look out without looking through a peephole. And if you think about it, you can go one step further. You can even add uh, your security system inside of the lock because I, mean, I don't know about you, but my security system's in a big gray box and it's got a big you know, motorcycle battery that keeps the yeah, thing up sure, there. Sure. And, uh, yeah, well, that can be all put down into a little tiny circuit board and put into the lock as well. And all of a sudden your lock isn't connected up to anything. It's 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 probably on 5G or Wi-Fi at the very minimum, mm -hmm. something you can't do today. You have to have a bridge for most of the locks. I guess August lock doesn't have it, but most of the other locks do. Um, and you can eliminate that. And you, it, all of a sudden you can just see that because you've got unlimited power, you can do things you never could do before because yeah. you're always worried about what's the capacity of these batteries because they have to last at least three months. Super interesting. Yeah. Have, have you guys, um, I haven't, I haven't looked through your entire website, but do you have uh, like blog articles or inside articles talking about all of the different kind of industries that are going to be disrupted over the next couple of years? Yeah. The, the website's full of okay, lots okay, of great. stuff there. Yeah. Okay, yeah there's articles, uh, white papers, there's uh, presentations. And of course I've got an old, another whole set of presentations and we've also got a YouTube channel as well. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. I'll, I'll, um, uh, I didn't. I didn't think about all the different kind of uh, not disruptions, like uh, industries that would be enabled or or opportunities would be enabled with this kind of technology. But I'm glad I had you on. It's uh, really interesting, and I'm thinking a little bit more about whether it's smart factories or you know the metaverse uh, vision goggles will be uh, enabled through this. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. Maybe one of the final questions here. Uh, we talked about it at the very beginning about the kind of potential market that you guys have. What what's required for you guys to scale up to be to have this technology be, I guess, ubiquitous, um, maybe in America, in the world, uh, et cetera. Well, one thing we we'll need to do, and by scaling up, I'm thinking you're thinking of quantity sold. Yeah. To get quantity sold where we can bring it down to the mass market. Uh, cost will have to come down. This mm -hmm. is a new technology, so it's a little bit on the expensive side. Still cheaper than adding wires inside <laughs> of a wall that's already put up. I'll say that. Yeah. Uh, so there's 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 good value right there in the retrofit market and in certain applications like the uh, the locks and security where you just can't run wires. But as as we as we start rolling this stuff out and and bring in revenue, we can start doing things that are more specific with with A6 and uh, better value on certain components help bring the cost down and then take it into more of a mass production which is what we're going to do now that we're when we talk about the size of the market and how fast it's going to accelerate uh we're going to have to hold on pretty tight uh as as we go up that hockey stick curve sure. Sure. Uh, so uh, we're we're very focused on that and doing things to try to keep the the cost down uh the things streamlined uh, and build upon what we have today uh, before we uh, dive into something else like the high, higher power units, for example. But uh, m my goal is to have this thing uh, down to the price point down to where a homeowner wouldn't hesitate to put one in every room, just like they wouldn't hesitate yeah. to put in a recess light because it, it looks just like a recess light when it's in the ceiling. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, any other points that you want to throw out to the audience here, Kurt? I see we're kind of uh, coming up to the time that uh, that we had allotted for this. Well, I just say that when when you look at the market where our competitors are, we're we're, we're quite far ahead, many years ahead, and the technology being safe like it is, I think it's going to catch on quite quickly. Yeah. Uh, once people understand the value of of what it can do, I mean, the, the one thing I thought this would would blast off in the quantity was servicing uh, restrooms and all the plumbing fixtures that we have sure. in uh, commercial restrooms. And you think about all those flush valves and touchless water faucets, which we've done, we've done all those, we've shown them at mm -hmm. multiple times in the shows uh, would, would take off. But the, the issue is that you have to convince uh, the people that buy the uh, faucets and buy the flush valve so that'd be you know your big industrial complexes and your arenas and your hospitals and your so on that um they need this uh mm -hmm. and and the cost advantages of not having the service 
these batteries, plus the fact that everything's on the on the web, so you can uh, know when you're out of you know soap lotion and you're out of paper towels. You, you'll know all that. Uh, you don't have to go in and check. So there's there's lots of things you you have to, have to kind of train them to tell the suppliers that make the the fixtures that make the flush valves. I need this because even though it's going to cost me a little more, I'm going to save it because I don't have to have all the maintenance that I need right now to take care of batteries and take care of the soap and take care of the paper towels and so on. And 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 uh, once once that happens, I can see the big push into that market as well. But right now because it's 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 kind of a pull through sales and it's kind of hard to do because we have to go out and talk to uh the commercial builders and we're just not big enough to do that at this point in time we'll get there mm -hmm. and then i think you're going to see this stuff just really start to accelerate awesome awesome well thank thanks uh thanks a lot for coming on kurt uh, you really kind of opened my mind to uh i guess i guess we could call it like an enabling technology i've always been thinking about disruptive technologies but i think that this is something that's going to enable quite a quite a lot of things uh, in the future i'll have your your uh we charge website uh up on the show notes of the episode are there any are there any other places that you would like uh, the audience members to to follow to get in touch with you guys or is the website's probably the best place a website is a good place if you actually go to the let's see if i can find that i might have it right up here uh, if, I think you go to the contact us mm -hmm. uh, part of the website. Uh, we've got uh, you, can, you can call our main office. It's in the outside of Tel Aviv uh, or I uh, call me. I'm in the Dallas office. Uh, we also have somebody in uh, uh, Germany to take care of that. We have somebody in Korea. Okay. So we've got different areas all around the world where you can call in uh, or they can just email me. It's uh, my first name dot last name at uh, ycharge.com. Don't forget the hyphen between Y and charge. Yeah. And uh, it'll it'll be it'll get to me. Terrific, terrific. Well, uh, again, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure, and uh, good luck with scaling up the business and uh, changing the world in some very interesting ways that I hadn't thought about before. So, thanks for coming okay, on. Hey, thank you, Mark, for having me. I appreciate it. It was Absolutely. fun. Great. All right. Bye bye. Well, thanks for listening to this week's Future Tech and Foresight podcast. If you like what you've heard here, there are, of course, a number of ways that you can support the podcast. The best way would be to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or give a rating on Spotify, which you can find a step-by-step -step explanation for on the futuretechandforesight.com website. Alternatively, feel free to leave a comment either on the episode show notes or the YouTube channel where you can see video recordings of the interviews. And finally, if you are part of an organization that is aware of the disruptive and transformational impact that emerging and future technologies will bring and want to know more, please get in touch to hear about the strategic foresight services that we offer and how we can help future-proof your organization and take advantage of the phenomenal opportunities available to survive and thrive in the future. A lot of future-shocked people and future-shocked institutions in our society are simply Overwhelmed. Once there is superintelligence, the fate of humanity may depend on what the superintelligence does. Science fact is catching up to science fiction. The first truly intelligent machine will be the last invention that humanity needs to make. The only scarcity that will exist in the future is that which we decide to create ourselves as humans. Within a 10 year design revolution, we can have all humanity living the highest and living anybody's ever known. Progress is uh, accelerating at an exponential pace and it's gonna reach a point where progress is so fast it's going to be a singularity. We are probably one of the last generations of homo sapiens. Every single headline points to the birth pangs of a type 1 civilization.